Welcome, I'm Country Boy, and this is One Mike History, and today's episode is about the Scottsboro Boys. The Scottsboro Boys were nine black teenagers who were falsely accused of raping two white women aboard a train in Scottsboro, Alabama in 1931. Their trials and retrials of the Scottsboro Boys sparked an international uproar and produced two landmark U.S. Supreme Court verdicts even as the defendants was forced to spend years battling courts and enduring harsh conditions within the Alabama prison system. If you like stories like this, please hit the subscribe button. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so at my Patreon or Buy Me Coffee, linked in the description below. And you can find more stories like this at OneMikeHistory.com. But without further ado, let's get started. In the early 30s, the nation was in the middle of the Great Depression and many Americans would try to catch trains and rides on freight trains that moved about the country search for work. On March 25, 1931, while riding a Southern Railroad freight train, a white man stood on the hand of Haywood Patterson and almost knocked him off the train. A fight would break out and the black travelers would expel the white travelers off the train. The defeated white travelers would spread the word of what happened and an angry mob met the train in Paint Rock, Alabama, ready for lynchings. The police would arrest nine youths, Charlie Weems, Oscar Powell, Charlie Norris, Andrew and Leroy Wright, Olin Montgomery, Willie Roberson, and Hayward Patterson and Eugene Williams on minor charges. But when the deputy questioned two white women, Ruby Bates and Victoria Patterson, they would accuse the boys of raping them while they were aboard the train. The women told police that they were going from city to city seeking meal work. And as hobos themselves, the women could have been tried on charges of vagrancy and illegal sex work. Nevertheless, less than a week after their arrest on March 25, 1931, the grand jury would indict the boys and the trial was set for April 6, 1931. The National Guard was summoned to disperse a violent crowd that surrounded the jail and defendants who were held in the jail in Scottsboro had to be moved 60 miles away under the protection of the Alabama National Guard. The Scottsboro Nine would only be delivered back to Scottsboro on the morning of their trial and the judge ordered the Alabama Bar to assist the defendants and it wasn't to the first day of the trial that the defendants were provided the services of two volunteers Tear lawyers, 69 year old retired attorney Milo Moody, who had not defended the case in decades, and Stephen Roddy, who was a real estate attorney, was there to assist him. On the first day of the trial, more than 10,000 visitors invaded the tiny town of Scottsboro, which had a normal population of just 2,000. The judge and the prosecutor wanted to speed up the nine trials to avoid any violence. So the first trial only took a day and a half and the rest of them took place one after the other. The entire trials only lasted four days. And despite testimony by doctors who had examined the girl stating that no rape had occurred, the all white jury convicted eight of the nine boys to death. Only the youngest, Leroy Wright, who was 12 at the time of the incident, his case ended in a hung jury because some jurors felt that life sentence would be more appropriate considering his youth than execution. A mistrial was declared for Leroy Wright. Wright remained in custody until 1937, awaiting final verdict from his co-defendants. The announcement of the verdict and the sentencing brought a storm of charges from outside of the South upon the blatant miscarriage of justice that occurred in Scottsboro. After the demonstrations in Harlem, the Communist Party USA took interest in the Scottsboro case. The legal wing of the American Communist Party, the International Labor Defense, sent a telegram to Alabama's governor, Benjamin M. Miller, stating that the young men had been framed and were victims of a legal lynching. The ILD demanded a stay of the execution and promised to file a motion for a new trial and appeal. The ILD felt that the case had the potential to galvanize public support against racism as well as went over minority populations and highlight the inequities of American culture. The ILD retained the services of attorneys Charlie Clammy and Joseph Brusky. 
clammy move for new trials for all the defendants and private investigations took place revealed that Price and Bates have been prostitutes in Tennessee who regularly service both black and white clientele. Clammy offered Judge Hawkins affidavits to that effect, but the judge forbade them for reading them out loud. And the defense argued that this evidence proved that the two women likely lied during the trial. Clammy also pointed out that the uproar in Scottsboro that had occurred when the verdicts were reported as further evidence that a change of venue request should have been granted. In June of 1931, the courts granted the boy's stay of execution pending an appeal to the Alabama Supreme Court and the ILD launched a national effort to win support of the Scottsboro Nine during public gatherings. The defense team argued before the Alabama Supreme Court that their clients had not been given adequate representation and had insufficient time for the council to prepare for the case and juries were intimidated by the large crowd outside and finally that it was unconstitutional for blacks to be excluded from the jury. However, in March 1932, the Alabama Supreme Court upheld the conviction on seven other defendants, but granted Eugene Williams a new trial as he was a minor at the time of his conviction. The court stated that there is no consent on the part of the defendants that they had sexual intercourse with the alleged victims with her consent, so the defendants would not be granted a new trial. The case will be appealed before the United States Supreme Court on October 10, 1932, and ILD will retain Walter Pollack and the Attorney General of Alabama, Thomas E. Knight, will represent the state. Pollack would argue that the defendants have been denied due process, first, due to the mob atmosphere, second, because of the attorneys that had been appointed for them and their poor performance during the trial. Last, he argued African Americans were systematically excluded from jury duty contradictory to the 14th Amendment. Knight countered that there had been no mob atmosphere during the trial and pointed out the findings of the Alabama Supreme Court and the trial had been fair and representation had been able. He told the court that he had no apologies to make. Later in 1932, the Supreme Court overturned the convictions of Powell v. Alabama on the grounds that the defendants had not been given adequate legal counsel in their capital case, which violated their right to due process under the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court overturned Alabama verdicts, setting an important precedent for enforcing the rights of African Americans and remanding the case back to the lower courts. In the opinion of the Associate Justice George Sutherland, the court had found the defendants had been denied effective counsel and the Supreme Court did not fault the lawyers Moody and Roddy for the lack of defense, noting that both had told the Judge Hawkins that they did not have time to prepare for their cases. They said that the problem was with the way Judge Hawkins immediately hurried the trial and this conclusion did not find that the Scottsboro defendants innocent but ruled that the prosecutors violated their rights of due process under the 5th and 14th Amendments. As the second trial began in the circuit court in Decatur, Alabama, about 50 miles from Scottsboro under Judge James Horton, the Patterson case was retrialed first. The new lawyer, Samuel Lepowitz, objected to the African-American jurors being excluded from the jury pool. He called the jury commissioner and asked if there were any blacks on the jury rolls. And he was told yes and suggested that his answer was not being accurate. One of the board's accusers, Ruby Bates, counted her initial testimony and testified for the defense. But even with her testimony and the evidence from the initial medical examination that the women had not been raped, another all-white jury convicted the first defendant and recommended the death penalty. However, Judge Horton, having reviewed the evidence, met privately with one of the medical examiners and he suspended the death sentence and granted Patterson a new trial. In the additional series of trials, both Patterson and Norris were convicted and sentenced to death again in late 1933. The Alabama Supreme Court would unanimously deny the defense motion for new trial and the case headed for a second hearing in front of the United States Supreme Court. Attorneys Lepowitz, Walter Pollack, and Osmo Frankel argued the case from February 15th to February 18th, 1935. Lepowitz showed the justices the African Americans had not been added to jury roles and the justices examined the items closely with the magnifying glass. The state's attorney for the state of Alabama, Thomas Knight, maintained that the jury process was colorblind. 
On April 1st, 1935, the United States Supreme Court overturned the conviction and sent the cases back for a second time for retrials in the state of Alabama. Writing for the court, Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes observed the Equal Protection Clause in the United States Constitution forbade the states from excluding citizens from juries solely based on race. He noted that the court had inspected jury roles and chastised the judges and the Alabama Supreme Court for accepting the assertions that black citizens had not been excluded. According to the United States Supreme Court, something more was needed. The court ruled that it was a great injustice to execute Patterson when Norris would receive a new trial, reasoning that Alabama should have the opportunity to re-examine the Patterson case as well. Alabama Governor Bibby Graves instructed every solicitor and judge in the state, whether we like the decisions or not, we must put Negroes in a jury box. Alabama is going to observe the supreme law of America. Victoria Price will remain as the sole complainant and the grand jury voted to indict the defendants. Thomas Knight, now by 1935, was lieutenant governor, was appointed special prosecutor in this case. January 23, 1936, Haywood Patterson was sentenced to 75 years in prison. This represented the first time in the state of Alabama that a black man had not been sentenced to death for raping a white woman. The Alabama Supreme Court would uphold Patterson's conviction and Patterson would escape prison in 1938. He would publish a book, The Scottsboro Boy in 1950, and a year later he was caught by the FBI in Michigan. The governor of the state refused to extradite Patterson to Alabama and he was later arrested for stabbing a man in a bar fight and convicted on manslaughter. He would die in prison in 1952 after serving one year of his second sentence. The next day, in January 24th, 1936, after Patterson's sentence, Ozzie Powell was shot in the head after attacking a deputy sheriff with a knife. Both men would survive, and through negotiation, prosecutors would agree to drop the rape charges against Powell, but he was convicted for assaulting a deputy sheriff and sentenced to 20 years. In July 15, 1937, Clarence Norris' third trial ended in another death sentence. Governor Bibby Graves of Alabama in 1938 would commute his death sentence to life in prison and he was paroled in 1946. In 1970, he conceived a pardon and with the help of the NAACP and Alabama attorney, 1976, Governor George Wallace would pardon Clarence Norris, declaring him not guilty and Norris would write an autobiography, The Last Scottsboro Boy. Norris died on January 23, 1989. Andy Wright and Charles Weems were both convicted of rape and Wright was given 99 years in jail and was finally released in 1950 and Charles Weems was given 105 years in jail and was granted parole in 1943. On July 24, 1937, Alabama dropped all charges against Willie Robinson, Olin Montgomery, Eugene Williams, and Roy Wright. The four spent almost six years in jail on death row as adults despite their ages, and Thomas Lawson would announce that after careful consideration, every prosecutor was convinced that Robinson and Montgomery were not guilty and that Wright and Williams, regardless of their guilt or innocence, were only 12 and 13 at the time and in the view of the jail time that they served, they'll be released. Governor Bibby Graves had planned to pardon the prisoners in 1938, but was angered by the hostility and refusal to admit their guilt. He refused the pardons, but did commute Norris' sentence to life in prison. Ruby Bates toured for a short while as an ILD speaker, and she said she was sorry for the trouble she had caused them and claimed that she did become frightened by the ruling class of Scottsboro. Later, she worked in New York State in a spinning factory up until 1938, and a year later, she would return back to Huntsville, Alabama. Victoria Price worked in a Huntsville cotton mill until 1938 when she moved to Flintville, Tennessee. Victoria Price would never recant her testimony. Most of the residents of Scottsboro acknowledged the injustice started in their community. In January of 2004, the town declared a historical marker to commemorate the case of the Scottsboro Nine at the Jackson County Courthouse. In 2013, the Alabama Boards of Pardons unanimously, postmodernly granted pardons to Patterson, Weems, and Andy Wright, and in bringing a long overdue end to one of the most notorious cases of racial injustice in United States history. This has been the story of the Scottsboro Boys. If you like this and you like more stories like this, you can find me at onemichistory.com. If 
you want to support the podcast, you can do so at my Patreon or my Buy Me Coffee. It's linked in the description below. And if you want to see more stories like this, hit the subscribe button, rate us on Apple Podcasts, and peace.